Today, we will be focusing on best practices for RNA sequencing workflows. And just to set the expectation, this is meant to be a very high-level overview. So experienced users who are looking for more in-depth information are welcome to contact our tech support team to discuss your project-specific questions. The goals for this webinar are to learn how to determine a successful library prep and to understand library prep best practices. In part one, we discussed the different kit options for RNA sequencing, and we went over the RNA library prep workflows. As a reminder, here is our RNA kit mega matrix from part one, and this provides a comparison of the kits that we discussed. So continuing on from this, after we've completed our selected workflow, we would need to understand what a successful library prep looks like. To evaluate library quality, we would need to look at our library traces. Here, we have an example of a bioanalyzer trace on the left and a fragment analyzer trace on the right. And they look very similar. Here, we can see that both have upper and lower markers and library peaks. These traces help us confirm that we have a library. We can check whether our library has the expected average library size. And we can see if we have any additional small or large library peaks that may affect sequencing. We have validated our workflows with the use of the bioanalyzer or fragment analyzer from Agilent. But if we don't have these instruments, other similar instruments can work as well. Other instruments commonly used for library QC include the tape station, caliper, and Kayaxel. So zooming into this library trace, this is very useful in telling us what our sample or pool looks like in terms of size composition. So this trace in particular shows us that we have more fragments at 261 base pairs than we do at 400 base pairs. With this library trace, we can see a lower marker at around 15 base pairs and an upper marker at around 1,500 base pairs. These markers can vary depending on the chip use. If we're following the standard fragmentation protocol, we expect to see a smooth, almost bell-shaped curve with a peak at around 260 to 300 base pairs with our TrueSeq RNA libraries. Depending on what your experimental question is, there are options to adjust the fragmentation time. Adjusting fragmentation times will shift our library peak size. We can extend the fragment size and get a longer read length depending on our purposes. Smaller fragments will shift the peak to the left, and larger fragments will shift the peak to the right. As I mentioned earlier, we also want to look out for any peaks outside our main library peak, as these can affect sequencing. I will not be going into the details of traces and library QC, as these are actually covered in our library QC and troubleshooting with the Bioanalyzer webinar, which will be on October 21. I have provided a link to that webinar on this slide, and we will also provide a link to register for this webinar at the end of the presentation. If you have any specific questions about your specific library trace, you can e always email us or call us at Illumina Tech Support, and we would be happy to take a look. Now, let's get started and delve into RNA sequencing best practices that will help ensure library prep success. We will be going over best practices for the following areas. The RNA input, fragmentation, anchor ligation, handling magnetic feeds, equipment considerations, library QC and quantification, other best practices during library prep, as well as best practices for RNA enrichment. Let's start with input best practices. When we're working with RNA, we want to evaluate RNA integrity or RNA quality as this has a major impact on library prep performance. 
It will also determine which library prep kits can be used with your sample. We measure RNA integrity in terms of RIN, R-I-N, which stands for RNA Integrity Number. You may also hear a similar term, RQN, or RNA Quality Number, which is used with a fragment analyzer. These numbers give us an idea of the quality of our RNA and how intact it is. And this is based on the entire electrophoretic trace, including the 18S to 28S ribosomal peak ratio. RIN is specific for mammalian samples, so if you're working with non-mammalian samples, check the literature to see how RNA integrity is assessed for your specific sample. In this image, the top trace shows an example of RNA with a RIN value of 10. Here, we see nice sharp peaks indicating intact RNA for the 18S and 28S region. The middle trace shows a RIN value of 5, and here we can still see peaks at 18S and 28S, but we also start seeing more fragments at the smaller molecular, molecular weight region. This middle trace indicates degradation of our RNA, and this can be seen in our SFPE samples or samples that have been stored for a long period of time. At the bottom here is an example trace for strongly degraded samples. And you may notice that we can't distinguish the 18S and 28S peaks anymore, and there is an abundance of smaller fragments. Let me take some time here to say that in the rest of the presentation, best practices will be shown in blue tables like the one on the left, and consequences of not following best practices will be shown in pink tables like the one on the right. For best practices related to RNA integrity, let's keep in mind that for TrueSeq RNA V2 and our stranded mRNA kits, we are using poly A selection, so we want the RIN values to be equal to or greater than 8. With poly A selection, we're selecting based on the poly A tail at the 3' prime end of the RNA. So if the RNA is fragmented, we will lose the 5' prime end of the transcript. If we use a sample with lower RIN values, which will contain degraded RNA, some possible consequences are that we may observe 3' prime bias because of our selection method. We may also observe decreased library yield or incorrect library size because smaller fragments can be lost during our wash or cleanup steps. We may also see a library that appears small or observe unexpected peaks such as adapter dimers. These adapter dimers can form when we don't have enough input. It's also possible to have high percent mapping to contaminants. And here, by contaminants, we mean RNA species that we did not mean to capture. Having other species of RNA will cause nonspecific alignment to the reference genome and higher alignment to the contaminating RNA species. This will reduce our percent alignment metric. High percent duplicates can also result when contaminating RNA species are present. These can be amplified during the PCR step. If we are using stranded total RNA kits, we can use degraded material. Fragmentation time can be modified with TrueSeq stranded total RNA, depending on the level of RNA input degradation. Recommendations on how to modify fragmentation time can be found in the TrueSeq stranded total RNA reference guide. So to maintain RNA integrity, we want to avoid extended pauses until the RNA is converted to double-stranded DNA. We want to avoid multiple freeze thaws of input RNA. We would want to store the RNA itself in RNA-free water, or TE buffer, for up to a year, depending on the extraction method. We want to keep thawed RNA and reagents on ice. And we want to ensure that the thermal cycler lid is preheated for each synthesis step. Next, let's look at input quantification. For input quantification, we want to use the recommended total input required for the workflow selected. 
some of our kits have the option to start with a previously purified RNA. So if you have your own method of purifying RNA, you can start with your purified input. And this is typically less than the amount of total RNA required. We do recommend using a fluorometric-based method for quantifying RNA and not a spectrophotometry-based method such as the nanodrop. UV spectrophotometry methods tend to be inconsistent for quantification and is not appropriate for our purposes. Nanodrop can be used to assess the purity of our RNA samples, not the quantity. We also recommend DNA treatment to get rid of DNA contamination. And most commercially available RNA extraction kits include a method for DNA treatment. So what are the possible consequences of inaccurate quantification? Similar to low RNA quality, we can get no or low library yield, unexpected peaks in library size, low percent alignment, high percent mapping to contaminants, high percent duplicates, bias, and for our stranded kits, we can also have reduced percent strandedness. Now, let's look at our RNA selection and depletion steps when we're purifying total RNA. With our mRNA kits, we perform poly-A selection. And with stranded total RNA methods, we perform rRNA depletion. If using poly-A beads, ribo zero beads from our legacy ribo zero rRNA depletion kit, or RNA clean XP beads, we want to ensure that we do not freeze the beads. Once frozen, these beads lose their ability to bind to magnets and reagents appropriately, so they are no longer usable. With our new Ribo Zero Plus method, which uses enzymatic depletion rather than bead pulldown for our RNA depletion, we use RNA Clean XP beads for cleaning up our RNA, not for our RNA depletion. We want to ensure that all these beads are at room temperature for 30 minutes because um, cold, cold beads do not function as efficiently. So this is an important step. We also want to prepare fresh ethanol for bead cleanup steps. And we want to ensure that the thermal cycler lid is preheated and that it's capable of 0 0.1 degree per second ramping for best results. Now, let's go over fragmentation best practices. For intact RNA, we suggest using the recommendations provided in the protocol. This gives us the best coverage and most uniform coverage across the gene. Fragmentation time can be modified, but this can lead to reduced coverage across the transcript. If using degraded material, such as with stranded total RNA, Keep in mind that we don't want to overshorten our libraries. And fragmentation time can be adjusted with our TrueSeq stranded total RNA kit based on RNA integrity. Possible consequences of altered fragmentation conditions include decreased library yield and less uniform coverage across the gene. The importance of uniform coverage can depend on your experimental design. If you're looking at differential expression, you may not need even coverage. But if you're looking at transcript assembly, then you may want to stick with a recommended fragmentation time to get even coverage across the gene. Modification of fragmentation time is only applicable to TrueSeq stranded total RNA and not Illumina stranded total RNA. Next, let's look at anchor ligation best practices. As a reminder, our Illumina stranded mRNA and Illumina stranded total RNA kits use anchors for adapter ligation. This is in contrast with our TrueSeq stranded mRNA and TrueSeq stranded total RNA kits, where we directly ligate index adapters onto our cDNA fragments. When using Illumina stranded mRNA and Illumina stranded total RNA kits, keep in mind that there are RNA index anchors and that these RNA index anchor plates are green 
and these wells are single use only. The RNA index anchor will be separate from the index plate. We would want to add the reagents in the order listed and add the stop ligation reagent with STL buffer before the cleanup step. If these best practices are not performed, it can result in inefficient addition of adapters or formation of incomplete libraries resulting in low yield. Now, let's go over best practices for handling magnetic beads. We typically use ampere bead cleanup at the end of the reaction to allow us to size select. Based on the ratio of bead solution to sample, we can select fragment sizes to retain for the next step. With a, with a bead cleanup, the larger nucleic acids are preferentially maintained, and we get rid of smaller nucleic acids and other contaminants. You can find a lot of resources on how this process works by performing a web search for how Ampure beads work. The benefit of using Ampure beads is that we retain more of our samples than if we perform a gel purification, and the use of these beads is also automation compatible. So how does this work? Our sample will contain double-stranded DNA, enzymes, adapters, primers, and other reagents that we've added to the reaction. We will add beads, which will bind to double-stranded DNA. And based on our bead to sample volume ratio, we can retain specific sizes. Then we will put our tube up to a magnet, and the beads along with bound DNA will bind to the magnet. The enzymes and everything else would be left behind in solution. We will then remove the supernatant, perform an ethanol wash, and elute the, the double-stranded DNA from the beads, leaving the beads stuck to the magnet. And then we transfer the sample to the next step. So this is what ampere beads look like. They tend to sediment, so we recommend regular vortexing to mix them and keep them in solution. This is our recommended magnetic stand, which is listed in our reference guide. Keep in mind that not all magnets are the same. Different magnets can have different, different strengths, and the magnetic stand listed in our reference guides is the one that we have tested and works well with our kits. We recommend using the validated magne magnetic stand. Other magnets may work, but they may require additional testing and optimization. Here we have an example of what the beads will look like during the workflow. In well one, we have no beads, and you can see that the solution is clear. In well two, the beads are mixed with the solution in suspension, and we can see a brown slurry. In well three, we see the beads beginning to congregate near the magnet, the solution still has beads in, suspen in suspension, but the beads are starting to create a pellet. In well four, the beads are completely bound to the magnet and the well is clear. This is what we want to see before we remove the solution and proceed with a wash. We do have a video entitled True Seek sample purification, bead size selection, and best practices in our training page, and I've provided the link here for your reference. Now, for best practices when using magnetic beads, as I mentioned earlier, these beads need to be at room temperature, so make sure that we allow enough time for them to come to room temperature. Using cold beads can affect bead performance. The beads are in a viscous solution. They are dense, so they tend to settle. Because of this, you would need to vortex the beads thoroughly and make sure that they are in solution before pipetting. Again, use our recommended plate and magnetic stand 
The part numbers for these materials are in our reference guide. Keep in mind that different magnets have different strengths, and we have seen significant differences when using non-recommended equipment. Carefully pipette up and down to minimize sample loss, and avoid introducing bubbles as this can result in loss of yield. It's also important to use freshly prepared 80% ethanol for the washes, as ethanol tends to absorb water from the air. Make sure to avoid disturbing the pellet with a pipette during elution. The idea here is to flood the well and let the solution reach the bead. When we remove the ethanol, we want to let the beads air dry as residual ethanol can affect downstream steps. The most common consequence of mishandling beads is having no or library yield or low library yield. Since size selection is based on the ratio of beads to sample, aspirating a small amount of extra beads or having beads on the outside of the pipette tip can change the ratio. So look out for that. This can lead to unexpected library size and extra peaks in our library traces. Next, let's proceed with best practices related to equipment. In terms of PCR equipment, what we want to highlight here is the importance of using a heated lid. The image on the left is a microfield PCR performed with a heated lid. On the right, we have the same reaction, but without a heated lid. On the right, we can see condensation, and this can result in sample loss or inefficient reactions. So to prevent reagent and sample loss, we want to heat the thermal cycler lid to 100 degrees Celsius during incubation. We also recommend calibrating the thermal cycler to ensure that our step temperatures are accurate. Also, make sure to use the recommended adhesive seals to prevent sample loss from inadequate sealing at the edges. Now, on to library QC and quantification best practices. Once we have our final library, we want to perform library QC before moving on to sequencing. We recommend checking the quality of our libraries with a bioanalyzer, fragment analyzer, or a similar instrument as we discussed earlier in the presentation. We can check for our library size or for the presence of unexpected peaks like adapter dimers and bubble product. If we have high yield, it is possible to overload the chip, which can result in high peaks that don't make sense. In this case, we would dilute and reload with the appropriate concentration range. We can find example traces in the Check Libraries section of the specific library prep reference guide. I have also linked a couple of technical bulletins here, and these discuss adapter dimers and bubble products. You can hear more about these peaks at our library QC and troubleshooting with a bioanalyzer webinar next month. And as always, feel free to reach out to our tech support team for questions about your specific library traces. For quantification, we recommend using qPCR for best practice. qPCR is the best method to avoid unexpected cluster density as it measures complete libraries that can cluster on the instrument. qubit measures all double-stranded DNA in a sample, so it can measure incomplete libraries that will not cluster on the instrument. This can lead to overestimation of our library concentration and to underclustering on the sequencing run. Additionally, qubit will not accurately measure libraries with bubble product, which has both single-stranded and double-stranded components. Nanodrop is not recommended for quantification as it's not consistent and it measures everything at a particular absorbance including small nucleotides in the sample, so 
we recommend steering clear of the nanodrop for library quantification. Some consequences for using the wrong library QC and quantification methods would be unexpected cluster density, either over-clustering or under-clustering, which can reduce sequencing output. We may also see an equal sample representation, low percent alignment, and high percent mapping to contaminants. Next, let's go over other best practices during library prep. We recommend paying attention to proper storage conditions for the reagents. Note that reagents within our kits and even within the same box may have different storage temperatures. So pay attention to the labels and store accordingly. Avoid multiple freeze thaws by aliquoting reagents. Multiple freeze thaws can affect reagent performance, especially with enzymes. We want to carefully handle viscous reagents such as ATL or atailing mix and LIG or ligation mix and ensure that we pipette the correct amount. We also want to avoid introducing bubbles as these can affect the amount aspirated and transferred. We want to add reagents in the order listed in the reference guide. For example, in our TrueSeq stranded total RNA protocol, we recommend adding the RRB or rRNA removal beads to the RNA. We recommend following this order because we've seen that doing the reverse leads to poor depletion. We want to heat inactivate at 70 degrees Celsius for five minutes after a tailing. And we want to make sure that we are using the appropriate number of PCR cycles as recommended in the reference guide to avoid overamplification. Consequences of not following these best practices include decreased library yield, unexpected peaks, wrong library size, low percent alignment, high percent mapping to contaminant, duplicate, and bias. So far, we've discussed general best practices, which apply to TrueSeq RNA v2 and our stranded mRNA and stranded total RNA workflows. Now, let's take a minute to discuss best practices for the Illumina RNA prep with enrichment workflow, which is enrichment based. With this workflow, we first make our libraries and then enrich for the libraries or sequences of interest. With this workflow, we want to ensure again that the beads used, such as EBLTL and Ampure XP beads, are brought up to room temperature. As mentioned for other bead types, cold beads do not work as efficiently, and these beads should never be frozen. We want to ensure that we fully resuspend the beads to make sure that we're aspirating a similar concentration of beads each time or for each sample. We also prepare fresh 80% ethanol. When we are storing the beads or handling the beads, make sure that they are submerged in solution so they do not dry up. In terms of index adapters, the index adapter plate wells are single used to avoid contamination. Keep in mind that we would want to select the appropriate number of cycles for the PCR program, as the number of cycles used will vary based on the RNA input quality. When it comes to pooling and hybridization, we want to use either one or three plex for enrichment, and this is what we have validated. We want to make sure that we preheat our microheating system to 50 degrees Celsius, Fully resuspend and preheat the NHB2 buffer for five minutes. We want to keep it warm to prevent precipitates from forming. We also add the hybridization reaction reagent in the order listed. If these steps are not performed properly, it can result in inefficient hybridization and a final library pool which is not enriched for the targets of interest. 
For the capture and wash steps, we want to ensure the use of correct beads. In this case, we're using the SMB3 bead. We will apply our general bead handling best practices. Again, we need to preheat our microheating system and EEW reagent. We also want to ensure that the thermal cycler runs continuously throughout the capture and wash step. And the elution master mix needs to be prepared fresh with HB3. These steps will ensure that we are enriching for or capturing our targeted library. And finally, we want to follow best practices for bead cleanup and ensure that the correct cleanup beads are used at the right conditions, just as we discussed earlier with bead handling best practices. Now, let's look at some additional resources that you may find helpful when preparing your RNA-seq library. We have an RNA sequencing page that discusses different types of RNA sequencing. We have the Library Prep and Array Kit Selector tool to help select the kit that would be best suited for your needs and input type. The Gene Panel Finder that, you, uh, that can help you identify existing panels or library prep kits based on your gene of interest. A link to the sequencing methods review containing summaries of some peer-reviewed publications relevant to RNA sequencing. We also have a li a links to our recorded webinars on small RNA sequencing, introduction, and best practices for those of you who are interested in small RNA sequencing. We also have a link to the recording of part one of the RNA-Seq webinar series here, and links to the product and support pages for the RNA kits discussed in part one. Additionally, we have a list of RNA-Seq related bulletins here for your reference, including DNA or RNA isolation considerations, considerations for RNA-Seq read length and coverage, bead types in our library prep kit, our Illumina adapter portfolio, bulletins that discuss differences between the Illumina stranded and TrueSeq stranded RNA library prep um, and rRNA depletion methods, options for trimming T overhang, and a link to all our support bulletins. And that's it for our webinar today. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope this has been helpful.